morning, everybody. Uh, very happy uh, to be speaking with you this morning. Um, and I hope to accomplish a few things that will make your uh, time worthwhile. Um, this is uh, uh, the title of my presentation, and I'm uh, reversing back to our old motto. I like Latin, tentanda via. And uh, we're trying to do things in this university with sustainability uh, that respond to some of the challenges that uh, President Chukri uh, alluded to in his opening remarks. Um, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with providing you uh, with the so what part of the equation. Why are we doing these things? Why do they matter? A lot of people are questioning uh, the validity of uh, environmental sustainability or environmental protection. And I want you to walk out of today thinking differently about this, because it's not optional. This is about the uh, prosperity and the survival of the human race. Um, and then I'll provide you with some uh, uh, examples of how the university as a whole is innovating in the area of sustainability for many decades now, uh, and what the future holds uh, and the near present. And hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. So I, I got to make sure that I keep time of track of time. Because you know, professors, we have a bad tendency of uh, having always two or three hours to speak. So we need to be disciplined today. Um, so I'd like to tell you about my personal story. I think it's important to know. Uh, you may have noticed I got a little bit of an accent. Uh, I'm Canadian by choice, and I come from that country called Chile. Um, and uh, that's the city where I come from. It's a polluted city. Uh, it's a city that has not paid attention to sustainability a lot. Uh, and now it's paying the price of not paying attention to these things. Um, but now I live in that house, which is a solar house in Markham. And I'm very proud of that because uh, we made it uh, with our own hands. Uh, not the house, the house was already there, but we've made it into a solar house. And I install uh, solar photovoltaic systems with my own hands and uh, solar water heaters. Uh, and now I'm able to ride an electric vehicle that is charged in a day like this by the sun. Uh, so this is important to me because it means that our students are learning from our own investment. And I think that's an important aspect. I am a typical professor in the sense that I also publish uh, research, as Professor Chokri mentioned. That's one of the ways we do knowledge dissemination. And my approach for research has always been uh, focusing on working on groups of people to try to achieve change. And you didn't come to hear too much about me, but uh, I want to tell you uh, uh, about the other things that we do that are not written up, uh, but that are nevertheless important. So I belong to something called the World Council of Renewable Energy. I've been there as a chair. I'm not the chairperson, the only chairperson, but I'm in the chair's committee. And one of the things that I, we've been doing uh, is we've been working on the creation of the International Renewable Energy Agency. How many of you knew that the planet now has a new agency called the International Renewable Energy Agency? Anybody in this room? See, you learned something already. There's 152 nations, 152 member nations. In this part of the world, it includes the United States uh, and uh, Mexico. Um, in the Q&A, ask me why Canada is not a member. It's an interesting story. Um, but the point of the story is in 2009, we convinced many governments, including the Chilean government, I'm very proud to tell you, that creating an agency that would focus on renewable energy alone, it was an important idea. Uh, and now the agency, it's actually based headquartered in Abu Dhabi, which is an unusual move. Uh, and I think it's a very important move because Islam has a lot of people on it, about a billion people. Uh, and now people are uh, uh, arriving to Abu Dhabi, and there is an agency headquartered there, which it's only mandated to do renewable energy agency, and they're building a solar city that is called Masdar, uh, which in Arabic means the source. So this is an important place because soon you'll arrive to Abu Dhabi, get in an electric train, and pass through Masdar, the source, which is a solar city, and then you'll arrive to downtown Abu Dhabi. So this is a very important development. Um, another thing that I've been very, very involved on is uh, I've been involved in Ontario since we moved back to this province in 2005, six, on the creation of policies to allow the adoption of renewable energy 
in this province. So this started with the idea of facing out coal. Uh, you should be very proud of uh, this fact. Uh, how many of you knew that now Ontario does not burn coal anymore? Well, this is good. The ones that didn't know should talk to the ones that knew because this is a really important fact. We are the only jurisdiction that I can think of in the planet that has done this huge climate mitigation strategy. This is a big deal. So one of the things that I work on was in helping on uh, persuade uh, political people to create a law called the Green Energy and Green Economy Act that created the possibility of having feed-in tariffs for renewable energy. Does anyone know what a feed-in tariff is here? I see you're uh, going like this, so we all need to ask him in the break. <laughs> but in essence, the first step is uh, no more coal. Um, and this is a very favorite uh, shot of mine. This is the end of a coal facility in Ontario. It was a beautiful day for me. I'm a pacifist. I believe in Gandhi's work. But certain things should not be uh, allowed to continue to destroy the planet. And there you have one that was not allowed anymore. And now we have solar factories in Ontario that are building solar photovoltaic systems. How many of you knew that fact? In 2009, we had no solar manufacturing to speak of. And now we have several uh, factories like this creating top quality uh, renewable energy products um, that look like that. That's not my house, but it's a typical installation that we see now in Ontario. The other thing that we do in the university uh, in terms of knowledge mobilization and research, we've created uh, what's called the Sustainable Energy Initiative. And there uh, we do things like uh, the uh, Red Screen uh, Training Institute in collaboration with Natural Resources Canada. And there you see a photo of our graduates, these people that come from all over the world to study uh, how to do feasibility analysis for renewable energy. And I'm very proud because Natural Resources Canada could have chosen uh, to do this work with MIT or U of T or Waterloo or Oxford University, and they chose to do it with York University, with our faculty. So I don't like to blow our own horn, but we should celebrate sometimes. That's a good thing. Um, also, I work with the International Renewable Energy Agency in the creation of something called the uh, IRENA. It's what we affectionate, affectionately call the agency, uh, Learning Partnership. And I just came back from Abu Dhabi uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, to talk about how we're going to continue to grow this initiative. Again, our country, Canada, it's not a member, yet Canadians have a very important role on this. And even my students, uh, graduate students, are already working in the agency, which is difficult to explain to the people in Abu Dhabi, how come you're hiring people from Canada? But it's testament that we're doing a good job on the training. We also do a lot of publications, and I invite you to visit our website. Um, we write a lot about how uh, things can be different. And we bring the best people in the world. For example, that's my uh, friend, uh, Dirk Uwe Sauer, the best uh, authority in the planet on the storage of renewable energy. Uh, he's been holding for eight years a conference in Berlin and in Bonn, uh, an international conference, and he was recently <laughs> in uh, Ontario to talk about what is uh, the present and the future of the storage of renewable energy. Okay, so let's change gears. I mentioned to you there's some stuff to learn today, this morning, and this is part of it. So what is sustainability? Uh, usually people talk about sustainability with Venn diagrams, and they try to place where on the uh, intersection of the economy, society, the environment, lies this idea of sustainability. Personally, my uh, take on this is that this is about prosperity and survival. Uh, the survival of the human race depends on us being able to do things better for food, for health, for transportation, for heating and cooling, you name it. So it's a survival of the human species, it's at stake. If we don't do these things, we will poison ourselves. Uh, and it's also the basis of prosperity, because it turns out that if you become good at sustainability, you actually have the basis for a very uh, buoyant economy. Uh, exhibit A, Germany. Germany, it's a country that was able to take an entire country, it would have been the equivalent of the United States saying to Mexico, now you're going to be uh, American, and we're all going to be under the same flag, 
and not go bankrupt on the process, but actually prosper on the, pro on the process. And I know people, if you're from European descent, the Greeks and the Spaniards and the Portuguese, they're all a little bit not too happy with the Germans because of the economic clout that they yield. But this is an incredible country that has uh, achieved greenhouse gas mitigation to the tune of a significant reduction of their emissions while absorbing another country that was very primitive compared to Western uh, Europe and yet managing to have a good quality of life for the people of that country. Why does this matter? It's because this fact, whether we like it or not, we are going to be a heck of a lot of people. And those of you that are old enough, you will remember this story when we were 4.5 billion people. We've become seven and we're heading towards nine billion people. And uh, I actually think that's a good thing contrary to popular belief, because it otherwise means whose children are gonna die in the process. And I don't wanna see anybody dying. I want people to be able to do more with less. That is the reality of the 21st century. We're going to be increasingly crowded in this planet. And the model that we've been using in the 20th and 19th century, it's no longer uh, viable for the 21st, 22nd and so on centuries. I'd like to talk to you about history, uh, but I don't want to go so, so far back as the dinosaurs. I'm more interested in modern history, how we're using dinosaur juice, fossil fuels, to take advantage of uh, this very densely packed, uh, high energy content um, uh, treasure, while we're having this explosion of population, which is also leading to this problem that it's unavoidable. Greenhouse gas emissions in our uh, atmosphere are accumulating at unprecedented rates. Um, uh, all the scientists of the world that are serious about research are sounding alarms about this. And the sounding of the alarm has to do with this. The fact is, is that we have reached uh, 400 parts per million. Um, and it becomes like an academic discussion of what is the threshold for disaster? Um, will it be 450 parts per million? Will it be 500 parts per million? Will it be 550 parts per million? But ladies and gentlemen, the point is moot because the direction we are going, we're going to blow through all of those estimates if we continue to do things the way we have been doing them. So let's try to unpeel this a bit and figure out why is this happening? So in this chart, uh, you can see some of the key anthropocentric contributors to climate uh, change. And if you follow this, uh, you will know that the carbon dioxide conversation has been dominating uh, the scene for a long time, and there is no accident. It's a significant contributor to the problem. But we have a number of other pollutants that are emerging as a problem. Uh, we call them short-lived climate pollutants. So for example, black carbon, it's a short-lived climate pollutant that it's not really a greenhouse gas per se, but it has, it has a role on this, uh, 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 on, on this problem. And I don't wanna get into that level of detail right now, but just so you don't, I don't leave you hanging on the black carbon. What, what the heck is black carbon? Some people call it soot. Uh, and what it is, it's coming from incomplete combustion of things like diesel or biomass. So wherever you see a bus, for example, that uh, diesel bus that stalls and then starts and poof, a big cloud comes, well, that's black carbon. And what's happening with that stuff? It's going into the atmosphere. It has a long residence time in the atmosphere, not as long as greenhouse gases, but long enough that it actually reaches the upper parts of the atmosphere and it actually is transferred to areas of permanent ice where it actually falls into the ground and it changes the albedo of permanent ice, uh, turning it into, a, of course, a darker color, which means that the ice packs start accumulating, melting faster in a way. And the minute that you have openings in permanent ice, uh, this accelerates melting. Um, so it is a big, big problem. Um, atmospheric chemistry, it's beginning to be understood very clearly. There's still a lot of work to be done on this, no question about it. But it's beginning to uh, register on, on these problems. Now the good news part of black carbon, just to square that one off, is that 
the solutions to black carbon happen to have a lot of co-benefits for humanity because wherever there are uh, black carbon emissions, you are seeing health problems, asthma, things like that. Uh, and also, because it's in proper combustion, uh, you're seeing fuel wastage. So it makes a lot of sense to replace a dirty engine with a clean engine. Uh, you will save fuel, you will have less health problems, and you will have time to deal with uh, greenhouse gases. Now, this is a complex diagram. Uh, we call it a spaghetti diagram, but it tells you the story of how different contributors uh, to the problem are uh, affecting uh, change. Um, I have a better one. That's too complex. That one, it's uh, a little bit more accessible. Uh, worry about the sizes of the balloons rather than the percentages. But basically, we're burning fossil fuels for a number of reasons. And here you can see some of the big ones for energy purposes, for transportation, for industry. Um, and this is what I want to discuss with you next. Uh, but before I do that, I know that there is an uh, undertone of skepticism about climate change. And I call it an undertone of skepticism because it's kind of ironic. You know, the media has this tendency that they want to present the two sides of an argument, you know, to be unbiased. And why I go like that, it's because if 99% of the scientists are saying that it's a problem, and 1% says it's not, and it's more like 99.9999999, um, to give 50-50% of the mic does not make sense, right? We should give 99% of the time uh, the microphone to a group and 1% to the other. Anyways. We can argue that for the next 20 minutes, but you came to hear about solutions. What I want to talk to you is about other facts that make it so that we need to pay attention to this. So um, before I go there, this is the current energy situation. Um, this is a complex diagram, but in essence, what it's saying is that when we look at the planet's primary energy use, that's the energy use for everything, transportation, electricity generation, etc. The bulk of the, uh, of the electricity, uh, transportation, heating and cooling, it's coming from fossil fuels. A little bit from nuclear power, 2.7%, uh, and renewable energy provides the lifting on the remainder. Traditional biomass, it's a huge contribution, 8.2%, so notice that several times more than nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And renewables, modern renewables, do about 8.2%. Um, and then the chart breaks it down onto different things. But what I really, and this is based on a report that we publish every year uh, at that URL, and the new one's just about to come out. Um, but this is what I wanted to discuss with you at length, because it's not optional. Uh, you can have your own thoughts about climate change, but I think you may relate to this, uh, and this is a complex slide that I want to uh, take two minutes or a minute to explain. So this, what it's telling you, is that for the longest time uh, on, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been living at the top of the pyramid of energy use. So we've been using fossil fuels that were easy to find. You know, you would go and make uh, a hole in the ground and petroleum would relatively easy come. Uh, that, it's coming to an end. You know, we have a situation where the Alberta tar sands that everybody speaks about, well, they're actually here in this part of the pyramid. They're, they're abundant, no question about it, but they're not very concentrated. They're difficult to extract and difficult to access. Um, and we can only do that is because we're putting increasing amounts of money that make it possible to get at this resource. Uh, you can see that the top of the pyramid, it's a better quality resource in any definition that you want to uh, put forward. So this is the reality of the human race now. The days of cheap oil, easy oil, natural gas, etc., they're gone. We are now in a situation that if you want natural gas, you're going to have to talk hydraulic fracturing, fracking. If you want to have fossil fuel reserves, you're going to have to take uh, tar sands and use something to heat them up, to separate the sand from the bitumen. If you want to uh, dig for oil, you likely are going to go to very deep areas of the ocean, off the coast of Brazil, maybe off the coast of Mexico. 
And what you're going to see, it's increasing accidents. And we see on a regular basis increased accidents because it's difficult to extract, it's difficult to access, and the only way we can get at it is because we're putting more money and better engineering into it. But the, we've entered almost like a negative return on investment situation where we're going at it, we can keep going a little bit longer, but the uh, problems are mounting. And I'm not talking about climate change here. I'm talking about, remember what happened off the coast of Florida? Huge spills. Uh, you've heard about lack magnetic. Uh, you have heard spills all over the place. It's becoming uh, incongruous, to say the least. And it is because of this reality. So I hope you can remember this resource pyramid concept. Um, it's a very important one. Now, the flip side of this conversation is this. This is the physical potential of renewable energy. Um, and this is something that we do with our students on a regular basis. We calculate the footprint of renewable energy sources to be able to actually uh, pose the question, if we're not going to do fossil fuel or toxic energy sources, uh, what are we going to use? Well, this is an interesting proposition. That little uh, cube, the red cube that you see there, and I suppose there as well, is the global primary energy use that we need to satisfy our human needs. And each of the bigger cubes represents a renewable energy flow that comes into this planet on a regular basis. So you can see that the challenge of the 21st century is how can we tap into this huge flow of energy that comes into the planet in a manner that will allow us to take advantage of uh, these uh, fuel-free sources, solar, wind, uh, biomass have costs, uh, but many of them uh, don't have fuel costs. Uh, they're about installed capacity. So this is a huge challenge for the 21st century, 22nd century. I think personally, modestly, I could tell you that we should be using our collective intelligence to use the endowment or, that we have left on that pyramid to prepare for the economy of the 21st, 22nd century. Let's use what is still readily available to make the industries of the future that can manufacture the things that we're going to need to survive and thrive as a species. So that is the context of what I wanted to say. Time check, not bad. And let's talk about uh, what has our university done for all of these ideas. So let's uh, give you an abbrevi abbreviated history. Um, the faculty where I work, uh, it's called Environmental Studies, was founded in 1968. And I'm not going to walk you through every milestone, but you can see we've been working for a few decades on these concepts. Um, and I think the next slide shows it better. This is the units uh, on the campus that work on sustainability. And it's not just the Faculty of Environmental Studies. We now have a Faculty of Fine Arts, a Faculty of Law, a Faculty of Business, etc., that focus on how to do things better. Um, and the results are pretty impressive. Let's talk about energy, for example. I don't know if you knew about this, but We've been investing uh, $41 million uh, just to make things more energy efficient, efficient in the university. You know, things like retrofits in lights, better energy management. And some of you know this story very well. Um, this building, for example, it's a testament of what you can see. We're standing on the lobby. It was daylight illuminated. The idea was to take advantage of these flows. And this is where it starts getting interesting is that for every dollar that we invest, we get in conservation and efficiency out of these 40 odd millions, we get a dollar 20 worth of value. So this is actually profitable. It doesn't come at a cost. It actually comes to the university as a benefit, a monetary benefit. And of course it creates teaching opportunities because we make sure that our students can learn from these things. Now, how many of you knew that we have a district energy uh, network and a combined heat and power facility in this university? One person. So you need to tell everybody about this. I'll tell you quickly where it is because you can't miss it. It's called Chimney Road. Chimney Road 
It's called Chimney Road because of those stacks that uh, we have there. And what this is doing for us is that if you look at the uh, campus, uh, a map of the campus, at the moment about 60% um, of the buildings are connected to this district energy network. So combined heat and power, it's a very neat idea. What you do is you have an electricity generator, in this case a thermal generator, you turn the generator on, it produces electricity. But if you don't have a district energy network, all the heat goes up the stack, creating pollution. If you have a district energy network, you can capture that heat from the generators when you're generating electricity and either heat buildings in the winter or actually chill water to do cooling in the summer. And at the moment, this is working very well for us. Um, it's getting old. It uses an old technology called steam. Um, we're trying to do something about this so we can do things differently. So this is an interesting uh, story. Uh, here you can see this, the research of one of my master's students, and now he works for the city of Toronto on these things. Um, and you can see the existing buildings connected to the network. And let me show you what's gonna happen very soon. But hold on, that's thought for a second. Because in transportation, we've been doing some pretty amazing things. Those of you that have been friends of York University for a while would remember that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, 80% of the people came to this university by automobile, and 20% came by uh, public transportation. So circa around 2000, uh, Ted Spence, which was the dean of uh, the Faculty of Environmental Studies, uh, start working, actually it was a little earlier, start working with the former president, uh, Lorna, and uh, they say, well, can we invert this ratio and have 60% of the people come by public transportation and 40% come by uh, uh, automobile by the year 2010? Well, in 2007, we achieved 80-20. 80% 80 of the people now come to the campus on public transportation, 20% come by automobiles. How did we do that is, well, there's some strategies, uh, public transit, it's a key one, uh, but this is an interesting uh, chart. And what you see here is the number of parking permits per student, number of carpool permits per student, number of buses serving in the campus daily. So let's look at the buses. In 2005, we had 1,516 bus trips into this uh, university. Now, the latest one is we have 2,574. So I know in the weekend it's not as easy because the GO, for example, doesn't uh, come here. But during the week, this is a hub of transportation. So this is how we manage it. We charge you more for parking, which acts as a dissuasion for people driving cars. At least if they come by car, they'll try to carpool to keep things uh, cheaper. We have less parking spots and we have way more public transport. Um, so all of the things that we've been doing with sustainability have some of these results. We have 500 courses offered uh, related to environmental sustainability in all faculties. We have undergraduate, masters, PhD and postdoc opportunities. You can study pretty much anything to do with sustainability in this university. We have a 35% reduction in energy use since 2007. This is the latest figures. So that $41 million investment has meant that we've had a significant reduction on energy use. Waste, we have a 63%, uh, which is nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, not bad, you know, I think we should be almost uh, net zero, but 63% it's two thirds of the way. And as I mentioned to you, 80% of the people are using uh, sustainable transportation. We've received a lot of accolades and recognition for that. But what I say to people is that that is the past. And the people from the Ministry of Environment got mad at me when I say that, because they were all like, hey, you guys are so good. You got the 2013 Environmental Excellence Award from us. And I say, yeah, but we got it. Now, what are we going to do next, right? Because we're not gonna sit in our laurels uh, to just say, well, it's been wonderful. So you heard it from the president. We are undergoing massive change and we have a very unique opportunity that has opened only recently for these things. This is the view from the president's office 
Um, he talked about two subway stations. Well, that's one of them being built. Uh, probably now it has more advancement, but um, he spoke about the stadium, that stadium that it's being built right there. This, of course, I took it on the autumn. Um, so I want to talk to you about what comes next, because this is what keeps me very excited about being a York faculty. So we have the biggest electric vehicle in the country coming to us, the subway. Um, and the president spoke about this. This is what the uh, station in Barry Hall is going to look like. No more buses, no more cars, no more mess. It'll all be beautiful greens, of course, in the uh, summer. Fall. <laughs> and you're going to arrive to York like this, properly. It'll be a proper arrival. There'll be a beautiful station that you'll come out. Um, and uh, that's not the only one. We have another one uh, that it's going to be over there. It's called the Pioneer Village Station. So as they say in the internet, partner mess, we're building. Um, and all those uh, arrivals will be some, somewhere around like that. It'll look very nice. But there's also going to be a hub. So all those buses that come from all over the place are now going to arrive uh, to the north end, north end of the campus. So our students, our faculty, our staff, our visitors will not have to deal with diesel pollution, black carbon, that kind of thing here. It will be uh, outside of the campus. Uh, we won't be dodging buses like you do right now. So be a great place to be. Um, but um, this will allow us to do some very interesting things. Um, this is some work we're doing with the people from facilities. We want to create a smart grid arrangement so we can use combined heat and power and district energy to balance variable sources of generation like solar power. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more about that, but I want to focus on transportation for the remainder, if I may. Um, so when we have that station up and running, the Pioneer Village particularly, all these lands that you see here uh, are going to be developed. And we have learned from previous mistakes. We, we, we don't want to have something like the village. We want to have the villages, those houses that used to be university property, and now they're not Copenhagen. That's the most politely way I can put it. But we want these new buildings to look uh, very different. And they are the business case for us to expand our district energy network because they're heat loads, you see. So we can actually have an arrangement so all those new buildings can be connected to a new district energy network. So we can do combined heat and power in a very different manner. Um, and that's what that's all about. New combined heat and power plus district energy plus renewable energy. So I spend a lot of my time doing assessments of buildings. Um, so for example, an existing building, like many of the little ones that we have, could look like this. You know, we can add 250 kilowatts of solar photovoltaic. So when there is sunshine, they generate electricity. It goes into the local distribution network. We got lots of those, no problem. Because if you have combined heat and power and district energy, you can turn on the generators when there's no uh, solar electricity. And the new buildings should look like these buildings. Um, so this is a building across uh, the Chimney Road uh, area. So this already exists. It has what it's called solar walls. So it has solar walls in the east and in the west. So it captures the morning and the uh, afternoon sun to do heating. And this is a brand new building um, that unfortunately is not yet at York University, but it's five kilometers, no, 20 kilometers from York University in Markham. So this is Canada's first net zero energy building. So what this means is that uh, the solar systems that it has on the roof generate enough electricity on a yearly basis to offset the energy needs of the building. Um, and it's an interesting proposition when you think about it, because it is the harbinger of a future where we can talk about storage technologies, electric mobility and a number of other things to make not an offset, but an actual uh, reduction of energy. So this building is, just so you know, on Highway 407, you exit on uh, Kennedy Road and you'll see it right there. I'm not promoting the company, I don't get money, I don't have part of their stock, but it is an interesting uh, proposition. 
Now, this is another building similar to the one that I just showed you, um, but it's a bigger building that also has solar photovoltaics. So the point of the story is that we've analyzed the potential for just solar electricity generation in the campus. And in existing parking lots, existing buildings, we could easily locate 10 megawatts of uh, generating capacity in, in the roofs of, of existing garages, existing buildings. And the new buildings should all be like this. They all should be able to generate solar electricity when there is uh, elect uh, sunshine. And they should be also connected to our dis new district energy network. So we can have a business case for a new combined heat and power facility based on not steam, but hot water. Then we can replace the old timer we have in Chimney Road with a new system. Why hot water? white hot water and not steam, it's because what will happen is in a future where we can have a lot of renewable energy like solar generation in an area like this campus, what you will see is that more often than not we will be able to generate solar electricity. So we won't need to use the generation, the thermal generation, as often as we do when we don't have renewable energy, right? But the problem is you have to if you're going to do combined heat and power with district energy, you have to satisfy the heating and cooling loads, regardless of whether you can or shouldn't turn the generator on. You follow? If you're using hot water, then you can very easily generate hot water by using things like solar water heating, uh, ground heat uh, pumps, etc. So, and it's also very suitable for storage purposes because storing what hot water is much simpler than dealing with steam. So this is why we're moving in this direction. Okay, so let me remind you about this slide because you can see that transportation, it's one of the big elephants. Energy generation, it's another one. So I've talked so far a lot about energy uh, generation. I wanna talk a little bit on what I have left about uh, transportation. So, and, and I'm not going to talk about the subway conversation because that's the status quo, right? That's the business as usual proposition. That's happening now, be done in 2016 or so. So what we're doing is we want to talk about the concept of renewable energy mobility. So what if we could use solar technology to generate uh, electricity to offset the needs of electric vehicles? And what if instead of using private automobiles, we use auto sharing vehicles? Do you know about auto sharing? Anybody knows about auto sharing? Lift your hand if you know about auto sharing. So conversation for the coffee break. It's, this is very appealing to me because then not everybody can afford an electric car, but pretty much everybody can afford a membership to an auto sharing uh, cooperative that has electric vehicles. So what we've been doing is we've been um, working with staff and faculty and students. Um, so I love this picture because this is our new tagline. It's not Tentanda Via anymore. It's this is my time. So it is her time. It is her time to have electric uh, mobility under a renewable energy mobility arrangement. Uh, my dream is that soon parking lots will look more like this than the bare parking lots we have right now. And I want to tell you how we plan to do it. So we are looking at the parking lot where the vice president of facilities works. He's right there. That's his office. This is a parking lot that all the facilities people and visitors to facilities use. So we are doing a solar assessment, and we have the permission of facilities to do that. That's what allowed me to get grants to be able to do this. So our students use equipment called Solmetric, which um, I call it, um, and it's not a brand recognition thing, but it's sort of like the iPhone of solar measuring devices. So here are our students measuring the solar potential of that. Uh, using this unit, um, and what we want to know is what is the situation on that parking lot? Does it have potential for solar uh, electricity generation on a yearly basis? Then um, uh, the students uh, walk into our laboratory, 
they download the um, data into computers to do solar assessments and then we can provide you with a solar access and shade report that has um, very detailed data of what's going to happen to uh, a specific location on a yearly basis. This is what it's called a sun path diagram and it shows you, it's a photo taken with the solmetric unit that has a uh, fisheye lens. So you can see the trajectory of the sun throughout the year. And because it's a fisheye lens, it allows you to see the shading. You can even see the researcher's face there. And you can see that at certain times, certain things will shade you at certain points of the year, bless you. And then we can make a chart. And in this specific site, we know that in January, um, the solar potential in December of this site at a tilt angle of 25 degrees is at its lowest. So the potential is not bad, it's 75%, not optimal. And that is because of some of the shading that I mentioned to you. And then we produce a, a report, a very de detailed report at different angles that then allow us to, using that, begin to do the engineering work uh, for uh, forecasting what uh, solar charging station could and should look like. So um, then what we do is we go from an idea to something like this. So this is our colleagues from PowerStream. Um, anybody here in the territory of PowerStream? Well, lucky you, because PowerStream is the most advanced local distribution company in Ontario. Don't tell the Toronto Hydro folks I say that, but they're doing pretty neat stuff. So they have already a solar charging station, exactly like the one we want to build in the campus, um, and electric vehicles. The big difference is what we're trying to do is we're trying to replace vehicles like that one with vehicles that are uh, auto sharing. So our young people, uh, staff, faculty, all can have an option to see what electric transportation can and cannot do, because it's a different way to look at transportation. So those are our REM uh, goals. We want to achieve, use the data to achieve tangible policy changes in Ontario. So this can be replicated in, in different parts of the province. And also to familiarize all the members of the university community and our neighbors with this new viable and desirable transportation solution. These are some of our partners. Um, funders, uh, and we're working very closely with uh, local distribution companies. I mentioned PowerStream, Toronto Hydro, Woodstock Hydro, and a number of private sector uh, providers of equipment. Um, and I'm very excited about this project because it's truly paradigm shifting. Um, and you will see this soon, um, and I hope to remain in touch with you. So when we do the unveiling, the ribbon cutting or one important politician uh, and the president come to cut, uh, you will come and, and see this in, in the campus. These are some ideas for the q and I know I've thrown a lot of ideas into the audience. These are in case you want to ask me some specific questions that I've discussed. Um, they're not leading questions. They're questions that at the moment I'm dealing with of financial issues, how you do deal with risk, ownership and operation of staff, technical things. Uh, the floor is now yours. Um, I like to finish by acknowledging the people I work with. This, even this PowerPoint took all these people to make. Um, and uh, everybody that is acknowledged there contributed or contributes to our work in uh, one way or another. Um, we're not islands. Uh, don't be misled by people that tell you that they're lone wolves that achieve things. That's not true. Uh, we achieve things in community by working together collaboratively, honestly, um, and with passion because the problems can be solved. Humans created them. Humans ought to solve them. Uh, and the university has to be here to provide answers to society. Otherwise, we don't deserve to be here. Uh, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias.